so uh, I guess I started doing lots of art when my mom used to be the baker at yeah. home. She made great cakes and I used to decorate every single cake in the house. <laughs> But the best story is that when I bake a cake, baked a cake for a birthday at home, I'm a terrible baker, I put salt and pastelic sugar. Oh no. <laughs> the worst chocolate cake ever. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. I think that's a classic mistake. I definitely made pancakes with salt. Yeah. But that's because of the salt. Yeah, yeah, so no, nobody ate it. It was terrible. <laughs> I guess I learned that uh, you just can't be creative with cook with baking because it has to be an exact science and I'm very uh, loose about it so that's it <laughs> and what's your name yeah, I'm Tammy and Tammy Ellis and I'm a member of the EBA nice where are you from are you from Ottawa I'm from Ottawa yeah go for it it's all you right now Okay. Hello, my name is Justin, and I'm eight years old. My mom forced me to do this, but I'm doing it anyways. Since I was four years old, uh, well, since I was a kid, well, kid, 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 baby, little, yeah. uh, little um, I had an obsession with the movie Cars, so I had a cake only of cars for up to three years old to seven years old I think and then but this year I'm having a Star Wars cake so um, and it has Lego characters bye no. and thank you what do I say now that's my sister Ella she's six she's a little bit shy just saying I don't know. Do you like cake? What's your favorite kind of cake? My favorite kind of cake is it's a princess cake. Princess cake. Yeah. Have you had a princess cake before? Yes. Yeah? How many? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. One. One princess cake. And it was, a, it was Elsa and the ice and were blue. Because I like Frozen. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, guys. <laughs> Thank you. And cut. Hi, I'm Janet McMaster. I'm Jenny McMaster's mother, and she's being a cake tonight. Anyway, that's one of that's sort of a minor cake story. I have three cake stories. One story is about my husband's 50th birthday cake. And we had everybody assembled, and it, we, tried, we put 50 candles on the cake, and he loved bicycles, so we put plastic bicycles on the cake, and the entire cake went on fire for his birthday. So it was a very exciting 50th birthday. The second cake story was his mother who was in her 90s, and we were celebrating her birthday. And of course, the, we didn't have that many candles on her cake, but we had enough candles on her cake. But of course, at 90, she wasn't all that, didn't have all that much breath. So it took her about, oh, I think she tried 10 times to blow out the birthday cake. And she laughed and laughed, and we have the most wonderful movie of her laughing and laughing. Of course, that did not help her blow out the candles laughing. So eventually we all had to help her blow out her cake. And that because she was, I think she was maybe 92 at the time or so, and it was really fun. And the third one was that my daughter Carrie, in her wedding, decided to make a gingerbread cake for her, for, for her wedding cake. And she constructed this great big sort of castle -y cake out of gingerbread. And she and her husband were a little gingerbread man and a little gingerbread woman. And those are my three cake stories. Excellent. 
to go with my daughter being the cake tonight. My name is Nick Pantieres. I'm from Ottawa. My brother is Christos Pantieres. He's one of the artists here involved in the exhibition. Uh, cake. Well, I'm Greek, so cake is part of our uh, celebration, whether it be a wedding, uh, baptism, and the birthday. And I know that my wife is very fond of cakes. She makes wonderful cakes. And every birthday I have a special cake. Some of the cakes that I've had have included, well, the first one I got after we were married and my parents were there. Kathy presented me, uh, I think it was my 30th birthday, with cake with two big breasts sticking up like this. And uh, my parents were wondering what was going on. And uh, it's a very memorable cake. So it was a lot of fun. And my birthday's on Halloween, so uh, the day before Halloween, Matt night. And uh, I always get a birthday cake that's Halloween themed. And my daughters even made me a birthday cake on many of my birthdays. So. Also, being Greek, we have a tradition with cake. This is my third cake story, just like the other lady. <clears throat> On your wedding day, you have this massive cake, but the top part of the cake is supposed to be removed, the top tier, and then you freeze it, and you have it a year later. Uh, didn't taste so great a year later, but it was quite memorable. So those are my cake stories today. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Mark Adornato, and I am an artist here in Ottawa for the past several years. And I've got a cake story that uh, has haunted me since my childhood. Um, when I was young, I grew up in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, uh, for four years, and um, there's some weird stuff going on in Riyadh at the time. But um, anyway, to try and make my life growing up more Americanized and Canadianized. Uh, my folks would do things like birthday parties with all the kids around and, you know, we'd put on pre-recorded hockey games and cartoons from North America. And uh, they would bake me R2-D2 money cake. So it was, uh, I remember very well, I actually still have photos of this with these like Pepsi cans with all Arabic Pepsi all over it and stuff. And there was uh, this R2-D2 cake that I was a huge fan of Star Wars. And I uh, was all excited. We started cutting into the cake. And then I got a piece, and then I bit into it, and uh, it was, there was money cake. It was money cake. Did I mention it was money cake? Okay, there was money cake. Uh, so there was money in it, uh, wrapped up in, like, wax paper, and I totally, like, broke a tooth. I must have been six or seven, so they're all wobbly then, you know? And I wanted to just pop. So this is my birthday. I'm howling, crying, because uh, I got this bloody, broken tooth, and my mom was just like, oh, all the kids are traumatized. Everyone's traumatized. It turned into a nightmare situation. But... Um, it was called reals is the type of money in Saudi Arabia. So I got a couple reals and I went and bought myself something after with it. So it kind of turned out to be a good thing uh, to have the money. But uh, the cake was traumatizing. So I've never done an R2-D2 cake since then, nor a money cake. And I actually just thinking about it, my teeth get wobbly. Anyway, that's my cake story. Thanks. My name is Tina Nicodemo and I'm originally from Montreal. I live in Ottawa. I've been here for the past 20 years. And when I think of cake, I think of my Italian grandmother. And uh, every week she would make a cake, this huge cake. She had this pan. I, I don't even know where she got it from, if it was handmade by my grandfather. But it was this massive pan. And she would make a pound cake every week. And it would take about two dozen eggs. And if you were lucky enough to be there when she was making it, it was quite a thing to see her put all the ingredients together by hand. Um, but she'd make this magnificent pound cake. It was huge round cake. And then everyone who would come to visit her during the week would be lucky enough to uh, sample some of the cake when they came to visit and have coffee with her and talk about how things are going in their lives. So for me, it was just, I, I think, you know, when I think cake, I think of my grandmother, I think of love and and how much she loved people and having them come over to her house and, and just share in that cake. And um, I have the recipe somewhere. Uh, it's hard to, to replicate, though, the, the cake that she used to make. But uh, I miss that cake. 
it was a it was a great cake and it just brings back great memories of, of childhood and spending time uh, with her as well so that's it Um, we must have it somewhere. I, I don't have it, but I, I think my aunt probably has, uh, has the pan. Um, so yeah, we, we should try and make the cake together. That would be a great, uh, a great experience to have, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so you're welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Antonio Pantieres. I'm here at Cut the Cake and Let's Celebrate uh, here in uh, Canada 150. It's a great year. Uh, I was asked where was, I'm from Ottawa, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, born and raised here. Uh, so my cake story, that's what we're here for. I remember when I was, it's actually very vivid in my uh, memory, uh, when I used to, uh, when I had my birthdays, we always had a request. One of my aunts always made this Boston cream cake. So there'd be two, two round circles and then one would be obviously the face and the other one would be like cut in, uh, three curves to make the, the, you know, the ears, the bunny ears, and the other one would be the left, the remaining part would be the bow tie. So I really enjoyed that uh, cake. Uh, every, every, uh, every birthday I had when I was young, up until probably the age of 10, I wanted that Boston cream cake. So that's my story. And I still think about it. And when I came here, that, that's the first thing that came to my mind. So thank you very much. Um, my name's Eleni Pancheras. Um I'm Christos Pancheras' niece, and I love cake. <laughs> so, cake is my favorite food, and people know that it's my favorite food, and sometimes I'll be in class, like at school, and they'll bring me cake, and I'll eat it in the back corner. <laughs> this has happened multiple times, so I, have, I keep forks in my backpack, and people will bring me cake from home if they have a birthday, or if they made cake, or for some reason. And so, that genuinely makes my day. I eat cake after practice, after track I eat cake, like, all the time. I could eat an entire cake to myself, easy. One time, I stayed up all night with my cousin making a cake for her dad's 50th birthday. So that was pretty memorable. And then we destroyed it, we ate it with our hands the next day. But cake can change my mood, and it's part of my life. I love cake. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. I do love cake so much. Okay, my name is uh, Diane Lemire. I live in Chelsea, Quebec. I'm a fiber artist. Uh, okay, my story is about a little boy that I adopted from Haiti when he was two and a half years old. So when you, initially when you adopt, at the beginning you have to sort of do a cocooning. You gotta cocoon the kid so you don't, we don't expose him to too many people. So we've done, we did that for about six, seven months, but our community had supported us and they knew he was coming and they all had kids themselves and they were all going to be Teo's friend because his name is Teo. So I invited them all. So we had about 25 kids. I put a blanket on the ground. I, and Teo was very uh, interested in cars. So I made a cake, which was a, a huge car chocolate cake huge car so all the kids are are sitting around the blanket and the cake is in the middle and everybody gets a piece of cake and everybody eats the cake and then my son and maybe 15 minutes later I pick up everything and and I think the cake stayed on the ground yeah the cake stayed there and then we're socializing and everything and someone said oh, you have to come and see Teo, you have to come and see my son. And he was only three, maybe three in a month. And he had taken the rest of the cake and he had stuffed it in his overall. It w and I was like, so, I'm going. Anyway, it was, <laughs> and all the kids go, you wanna come, come and see what Teo did with the cake? And you know, as everybody was socializing, he was actually putting the cake in because I guess he wanted to keep it all for himself because it reminded him a lot of the orphanage and him having that cake was like so special. Anyway, so that's my story.
I didn't. I didn't. But I, I <laughs> Thank God. Up with my friend. <laughs> yeah. My friend, and I said, "Is everything okay?" And she said, "Yes." She she confirmed that she had gone to the hospital. I think she had had epinephrine. That's terrible. I mean, you never want to take it unless you have to. <laughs> Bonjour, je m'appelle Alain Poirier. Et, je suis né dans la basse ville d'Ottawa. Et puis, euh, c'était une famille très modeste. On était plusieurs enfants. Alors, lorsque maman faisait un gâteau, c'était toujours une occasion assez spéciale. Mais le meilleur gâteau qu'elle faisait, ça s'appelait un plat aux bananes. Alors, elle faisait un gâteau blanc tout simple. Elle le coupait en tranches, elle faisait une première rangée dans une grande assiette qu'elle recouvrait, recouvrait de, ban de bananes et de crème fouettée. Ensuite, elle mettait un deuxième étage de gâteau, répétait bananes et crème fouettée. Et c'était toujours un grand délice parce que nous avions quand même une alimentation assez euh, limitée, compte tenu du fait que c'était une famille très modeste. Et euh, c'est donc un souvenir indélébile pour mes frères et mes sœurs, le plat aux bananes de ma mère Gabrielle. Hi, I'd like to tell you a story about a mystery cake. Um, when I grew up, my mom used to make a mystery cake at Christmas time, and it was always checkered, orange, and chocolate, uh, and the icing even. The top icing was chocolate, and around the cake was an orange icing. And we used to have that special only at Christmas time. And eventually, I, I came to ask, well, how is it that we have this mystery cake at Christmas time? And so the story came out that there was a uh, cake naming contest at the local um, fair. And this was all uh, from my mother's side of the family, which is uh, Maritimes. And so a great aunt had named it Mystery Cake. So uh, that's how that came about. And so as I became an adult, I thought I should learn how to make this cake. And so just last year, I made my first Mystery Cake with my mom, and it was a great experience to share that together. And she brought out this handwritten recipe that she'd kept in one of those uh, spiral coil books and uh, probably from, you know, when my m grandmother had uh, written it down from my great aunt. And so it was just a great experience to be able to make this checkered cake, uh, which is now called mystery cake, and pass it down through the generations. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> so is it like a chocolate-only cake, or is it orange? No, so it's checkered. Flavor? So you actually make the two batters, and then you dollop one corner of the orange cake and then a dollop of the chocolate, and as it sort of settles, it makes it into the checker, and so you have three layers, so you offset the layers, and that's mm -hmm. the, the checkered cake. Nice. Yeah. So that it's sounds really cool. beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And I always wondered, well, how did you get the checkers in the cake without taking two cakes and cutting them up. Yeah, right? yeah. And so last year I learned that you actually have to portion it out yeah. to make the uh, Must be a, also a very thick batter so that it doesn't run into itself on, as well. Right, so it doesn't yeah. become marble. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so it was a really good, uh, I really enjoyed obviously eating it <laughs> growing up, but just the experience of being able to share the making of one with my mom. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, was good. So Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And I forgot to say my name and where I'm from. You can do that now. Um, pick up the mic. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so my name is Bridget Folds, and um, I'm from o Oshawa now. Originally, I was born in uh, Quebec, and so my father's side of the, of the family is French, but my mom's is Maritimes. 
and that's where this tradition had come from. Hi, my name's Kathy Monroe. I actually live across the street from here now. I'm uh, a native of Ottawa. I grew up eating <laughs> the bread from this factory. Um, I remember uh, the bread trucks with the horses. Uh, my father's family had Clark's Dairy and they had uh, horses on their dairy trucks too. Yeah. And I remember one of the ponies that this bakery put up um, a, a sort of a lottery winning in the 50s. He was a little um, gray uh, uh, Welsh pony. And about two years later, he ended up in my uncle's farm in Osgood. And uh, my sister, my brother, and all my cousins spent the last, the last next 15 years riding him. His name was Clippity Claw. And whenever I think of the bakery, I think of Clippity Claw. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just a, another story. It's more about bread and it's more about my mother's family. Um, they were German from East Pomerania and they came in the 1890s into um, what is now Eastview. And they made their own bread. It was a Christmas bread. Mm -hmm. It was a very rich egg bread with seeded uh, raisins in it. Mm -hmm. And we still have that tradition, although it's getting harder and harder to find someone who has the recipe. But um, breads are so humble, and, and yet they unite the family. And I remember going by this corner so many times and all you could smell was bed, bread baking and it was wonderful. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm from Mississauga and I'm studying in Ottawa so I'm here for my bachelor's degree. Um, the story I'd like to share the most is about Chinese New Year. It's a huge deal, it's basically the biggest uh, like Chinese celebration that we have every single year and every year my mom would make like tons of food it's like such a big celebration it lasts multiple days and we usually stay at home for dinner but we'll also go out eat with friends or go to our Buddhist temple go to church pretty much anywhere my parents had friends we would go visit them and one of the biggest uh, things that I remember doing as a kid is making the different types of cakes and these aren't just sweet cakes and they're not really baked like Western style cakes are. They c they're steamed or they're like pan fried. I guess the translation would just be to cake but it's not really cake in that sense. And what my mom and her friends all did was they would trade so each one of them had a specialty. My mom's was radish cake so made with like white radish it's kind of like a turnip i remember oh my gosh i remember grating like pounds and pounds of the radish because the first step before you can make the cake is to put it through a cheese grater so you get like the tiny little pieces of radish and one recipe would make two cakes and it required six pounds of radishes so and my mom had so many friends so i would be sitting on the kitchen floor with my brother peeling and grating these radishes through the cheese grater and eventually my mom would go and cook that. And that's also a multi-step process where the radish has to be cooked and then mixed with different ingredients. And certain ingredients had to be fried and then mixed in again. And then it would finally be steamed. And after it was cooled, it would be pan fried again. So it would be crispy. And it was so good. Our house would smell so good. And my mom would sw swap these with her friends. So some of her friends, their specialties included coconut cake or like a very sticky cake made out of glutinous rice flour or sesame balls, uh, cakes made with taro, which is kind of like potato. And oh, there was just so many different kinds of cakes and foods and we would all swap. So eventually we'd have probably one or two of each from each of my mom's friends and we'd have like a big party pretty much where we just ate all this cake and we'd take it home and we'd eat it for lunch. Like we'd take it to school for like two weeks afterwards just because there was so much food. 
and it was so great. Like, my friends would tell me, oh, I ate all of your mom's cake last night. My mom yelled at me because I ate all of it, but it was really good. And I remember all these types of stories, and we'd swap the same stories because we were all eating from the same kinds of cake, and it was just really great memories surrounding the festivals. So my name is Daniela. I, um, I'm Peruvian. I came here 12 years ago, so my cake story is basically... Uh, my mom used to make wedding cakes uh, in addition to her job, the day job, to, for extra money, and she, she liked doing them, but they are very elaborate. And we would, uh, my sister and I will have to be put to work just to create, the, you know, to help with the little flowers, and, and it was a, a very long process, and she will, close to the date of the wedding, she would probably stay up until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and we will help. So wedding cakes were part of our, you know, childhood growing up uh, you know to, when you see the work that is put uh, into a cake you know to be shared in, the, in, in a wedding uh, in any case that's more or less what those mean to me uh, I know now the cakes are much more well they use all these new you know techniques but it was I remember my mom used this merengue and so it was very hand crafty you know so everything had to be done by hand and take a lot of time so um, that's basically my story growing up uh, oh, what did she make all the individual flowers oh yes she will make every single individual flowers with uh, this sugar mix that will get hard and she will use tool like these fabrics to make uh, this arch that will be around. because these cakes were like three four five six six levels you know it was wow. some of them big so the, the other thing is, um, the part that was very stressful was usually the transportation because some of them would, wouldn't make it, but she oh. learned how to put pieces together. She was so resourceful that, I, I remember being a child but being stressful about it, but she seems to al already have developed a technique to, if something falls down, she will put it together right away and you know have some additional merengue on the side. Yeah. So yeah, no, I, uh, it's a very fond memory in my childhood. Every, every, even though it was very labor intensive and mm -hmm. you know, anyway, so that's Did the you story. Ever have one of her wedding cakes? Yes, we will get the, because they need to cut, you know, the excesses to put the merengue and so everything is nice and perfect. So my sister and I will love just to be there to lick on the spoons and leftover cake that she will cut off yeah. before decorating them. So yeah, we, we do have a fist with cake uh, leftovers. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yes. Hello, my name is China Doll. How you doing, my little fortune cookie? <laughs> yes, I have an anecdote of a cake. Well, growing up in Ottawa, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, when we were, I'm one of eight siblings, so I remember going to the bakery, the National Bakery on Bank Street, and we used to go there every time. Every time we went in, they would give us a sugar cookie. Whatever we bought, we bought meat pies, sausage rolls, but every time we bought a birthday cake, which we look forward to, the cakes that they made was just, you know, plain old cakes, but inside was wrapped little coins of money, like five cents, ten cents, wrapped in plastic paper, so when you were lucky, we always anticipated looking for a piece of money, some money, so we could buy comic or ice cream or soda pop with it. So that's my favorite story of any desserts. Yes. Thank you, my little fortune cookies. Chow mein, shayonara. Adios. I bid you adieu. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jenny McMaster, and I am one of the cake ladies, and I am going to tell the story of the cake show. So this is back in... Uh, around 2015, 2016, um, and I was shopping for fabric and I was noticing how kind of laces and ruffles look very much like pastries and like, um, why are women dressing up like cakes? Why does a wedding dress look so much like a wedding cake? So I became kind of fascinated by that. So I painted and constructed this piece called She Forgot to Jump Out of the Cake, so a woman who's imprisoned in a fragment of cake that has already been cut up. And uh, my friend Karina Bergmans looked at the piece and she's like, I want to do something cake related too. So what she started doing was creating fake cakes, you know, out of things like spray foam 
and modeling paste and then painting them. And, and she would bring out one of these fake cakes and, and say, oh, hey, who wants a piece of cake? And everyone would be like, me, me. And then she'd be, it's fake. So I said, like, well, why don't we put together a show, make a show? And so um, we both put together a cake outfit. And Karina actually made these shoes. These are my blueberry loafers. And I, with the help of a couple people, put together this dress, the cake dress. Stand up so you can see it. And, uh, and so uh, we did a performance at Pucka Gallery. And this is, I believe this is 2016. And I sang the song, If I'd have known you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. And Karina read from The Edible Woman. Um, so a lot of the idea of what the cake show was about was like you were kind of the high priestess of the event carrying out the cake as the woman, but you're also the main dish. And isn't that kind of strange? But we were also really kind of interested in the fact that the cake is the heart of the ceremonies. Like you can't leave before the cake comes out and everyone shares of the cake. So it's almost like a, kind of a sacrament uh, in a secular world. And there was also the element of, you know, kind of fakery and making things which very much resemble cakes, which are really made out of fabrics or made out of modeling paste and some such things. So now um, it's about 11 years later in 2017, and in honor of Cut the Cake Celebrate, I am redonning my dress. And I'm, I'm really happy I can still fit into my wedding dress <laughs> 10 years later. Today, my name is Larry Fraser. I'm a photographer. I've been living in the same neighborhood as enriched bread artists for quite a few years, and um, been coming to their shows, annual event. Uh, when the EBA started, I'm not exactly sure. I think I was still in Toronto, uh, but uh, I started my career uh, in photography in Ottawa in the 1970s and uh, always considered myself a, uh, an artist working in photography medium. And so I was always keen on the uh, EBA show because one of my, one of my uh, main themes is social landscape and what goes on in the community and, and especially when that involves food. So when you said you had some stories about cakes, I remember I always used to love coming to the EBA openings because they had such interesting layouts of food. Now, mostly chips and things like that, but sometimes really quite well done. Um, one of the uh, early my, my, uh, photographs that I got that really inspired me to continue to do this was in 1998, when the, uh, they had, uh, one of the artists had um, chair, a chair, upholstered chair covered in beautifully arranged uh, white bread slices. And I thought, now that's art, you know, this is really getting somewhere. So I, I was very pleased to take a picture of that. Back in those days, we used film. And uh, I still haven't found a better medium than the color slide um, for, for, for my particular art. But that means that, you know, since I stopped making Seba chromes back in the 1970s, I don't really have a good way to show uh, my art. Uh, a projected color slide is quite an interesting thing. You get to control the, 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 the projection and the sequencing and so on. And to me, that's you, know, you can make a very interesting uh, piece of, uh, of, of, of culture that way. Um, so, uh, you know, I have had some opportunities, but not very many. And now in the, uh, to, to, to have that kind of show, uh, and now with the digital age, uh, this is so much easier, but I don't consider an electronic thing on somebody's screen uh, at home or, or on their cell phone or whatever to be the same, you know, it's not the same experience as having a show of projected images, big, clear, crisp, and, but casual. And, uh, and, and so I'm seeking still to find a way to, uh, to, to, to get, you know, to show the kind of thing I do. Um, so, uh, you know, 
I have got a lot of slides, which I'm always looking for a venue to project them. Um, like I say, social landscape, food, this sort of thing. And uh, so, I, you know, I've always had, you know, when I do, and I don't have not come every single year to the, op the EVA opening, but, uh, but most years I come, and uh, so I've got a pretty good collection of stuff, so maybe you'd be interested in having a little show sometime as an adjunct of whatever historical event like this, perhaps. Uh, uh, I can put on a little show. Sure, we can explore that for sure. All right. So those slides that you have in your hands, I did, they I just quickly pulled three from the sort of thing, a picture of the chair with the... Oh, excellent. With that thing, and then another one with somebody's table, beautifully done. And then another one was, you know, I don't always just do food. There was one somebody had a pair of uh, beautiful um, slippers, silver slippers with pom poms, and three rat exercise wheels on the floor. And I don't know what that was, but I, I liked it, and so I took a picture of it. Mm -hmm. So again, this is you know this kind of collaboration I really would uh, enjoy making. Sure. Well, thank you for sharing. All right. Hi, I'm Reek, and I'm from Ottawa, and um, my story is my wedding cake. I'd always wanted to make my own wedding cake, and I made, um, I did a lot of research on what kind of recipes and whatever, so I made a multi-layer cake with little liqueur glasses between the th second and third tier to make it really pretty, because that was in in those days, and then we had to drive it to my future in-law's place where the wedding was going to be and my fiance had an old bell van repair van and so you know it wasn't it was hard to carry it there it was very unstable and we came up to the intersection and the light turned red and he couldn't stop because if he'd have stopped the whole cake would have gone down and there was a police officer there. <laughs> Luckily, the police officer let us go when he saw what this was, although he thought the excuse was rather interesting. And, and the cake made it safely, and it did everything it needed to do. So that's, that's my cake story. What kind of cake was it? It was... Um, a white pound cake with apricot brandy flavoring and apricot brandy buttercream and then flowers and whatever. That sounds lovely. Yeah. It's impressive that you made that. Yeah, well, I, I, I love baking. I always, I always have. I, I'm the crazy lady that brings baking to Joe's Cafe for his staff. <laughs> so. Hi, my name is Mima, and I'm from Ottawa. And my uh, cake story is uh, when my oldest daughter, Julia, uh, turned one, I ordered a birthday cake, and it was at this at that time, Loblaws had just moved onto Bank Street, so it was like 21 years ago, they into their new location, and I ordered uh, a slab Mickey Minnie Mouse cake for her first birthday, and I was like, just no nope, plain vanilla, and you know, I was determined not to get her, give her chocolate and and just a plain white cake. And when I got it and started to serve it, I, they gave me a chocolate cake instead. So that's that's my cake story. So they got me. <laughs> so everybody had she got chocolate cake for her first birthday. Spoiled. Yeah, she 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 did like we we're pretty we like Disney pretty much we've grown up as, with as a Disney family so liked all the princesses and all that so uh, yeah that was the first one first thing we did and so had everything Minnie Mouse and got it decorated was all excited first kid's birthday and uh, and it's like I go they screwed it up <laughs> so. she was happy anyway oh yeah she was thrilled. She was one, and she had cake, and she was happy, so. Excellent. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing. Okay, thanks. Um, hi, my name is Sophia. I'm 
from Canada, Ottawa. And um, my cake story uh, was at my very first birthday, and it was my first cake all to myself, and me having the responsibility of blowing out the candles. And I decided to reach out and try to grab him at the candle, and found out that it was very painful, and burned my finger for my very first birthday. Oh no. Hi, my name is Julia and I'm from Ottawa. Uh, growing up with, as a child with food allergies, my mom had to be creative and found a unique recipe that was able to accommodate my allergies. And growing up, it became a favorite recipe, immortalized in our school cookbook. She made the recipe into butterfly cupcakes. And since some of those allergies faded away, uh, I moved back to Cake Mix. And one day I came back to it and realized how delicious it was just being from scratch. Yeah. What kind of cake was it? Uh, it was just a vanilla cake. Yeah, it was had no eggs, no nuts, no milk. A vegan cake before vegan was actually cool. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. So what did you use instead? Or? Uh, I think it was baking soda and vinegar um, were some of the things that helped the cake rise. And it had sugars and oils and flours in it. Yeah, it was very delicious. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So when's the last time you ate that cake? I feel like I made it like last year or the year before. So yeah. any opportunity there is for cupcakes. Actually, no, I made it in for some volunteers that came in to where I volunteer. And I made them the cake. And then at the end, I said, just so you know, this is vegan cake. Vegan stuff can taste good. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, no problem. My name is Marisa, and I'm originally from Italy. I arrived to Canada in 84. Before coming to Canada, in my teenage years, I used to bake with my dad. And we used to bake one special cake, only in very special occasions, and the cake is a Santa Nore. When I came to Canada and I met the man who is now my husband, for his birthday, I baked him a Santa Nore cake. And then years after, when we got married, we uh, had a very small ceremony and a dinner with only 14 people. Uh, we booked a restaurant and we left the chef to decide, the chef owner, to decide the meal and we didn't order anything uh, special. But at the end of the meal, uh, what came on the table was a Santa Nore cake. Well, the sad thing was that my dad, unfortunately, was not there to share the cake, the cake with us. That's emotional. Uh, but yes, the Santa Nore has been a cake that has marked important events in my family. What kind of cake is it? Santa Nore. Santa Nore is a, a cake that has a, a spongy cake, uh, base and then has puff pastry all around it, uh, filled up with uh, whipped cream. Oh, that sounds yeah. great. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, my name is Joe Calabro from uh, Pasticceria Gelateria Italiana, or Italian Pastry Shop, but uh, 200 Preston Street. We've been there for the past 39 years, since 1979. Uh, basically, we were the first one in the city with uh, gelato making, and European style cafe, cappuccinos, lattes, and basically, we're going to a third generation of customers, which that makes me happy. And it makes me happy also to see our regular customers and young customers enjoy the desserts that we make. Uh, basically, I enjoy what I do. I've been doing that for the past 39 years. And I still enjoy what I do, and which is uh, work with chocolate, sugar, and uh, making wedding cakes. and special occasion cakes for birthdays and everything else that uh, the customer is happy and gives you compliments when they see the cake or when they come pick up the cake. And also is uh, what anything else, uh, they write you a little note and when you receive that, that makes your day at the same time. And same thing is uh, regular customers coming in for coffee or breakfast, uh, same thing, if they're happy, they compliment you, which they do, and uh, they've been there regularly 
which I have some that have been coming there for the past 39 years. Uh, some of them come seven days a week, punctually every morning at the same time, uh, opening the coffee where they're gonna have order their coffees. Usually there's two cappuccinos, first is one, and after a while they'll take the second one and uh, they read the paper and between them and once they see it, they become friends with other customers at the same time. So. I still enjoy what I do, and uh, hopefully I still continue to enjoy what I do, uh, whether it's in the business or uh, privately. Well, perfect, thanks Thank for sharing. You. So my name is Christos Pantieras, and I'm from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, and uh, I'm a Greek Canadian, and I mention that because some of my stories are um, relevant to the fact of that heritage. So I have a few small anecdotes. One is that as I was growing up, uh, when I was really young and it was my turn to have a birthday cake and a birthday celebration, the family would gather around and sing me happy birthday. But for whatever reason, I didn't like that and I would always start crying and I'd go under the table and I'd hide there until I felt it was okay to come back out. But I grew out of that. And I also remember my aunts um, always creating this kind of like bunny cake or um, dog cake. And it was like this Boston cream cake with uh, Smarties on top and so on. And it was probably out of a box, but we always were so looking forward to it every time it was someone's birthday because we just loved the cake. We loved the way it looked and all that. Um, and then finally, um, around New Year's, we have this cake called a vasilopita. So it could be more bready or it can be more cakey depending on the recipe that someone uses. But uh, like many cultures, it's a cake where um, there's an, a coin inserted inside of it and you cut up the cake in various pieces and typically it's a piece for every member of the family. Um, some people choose to do it for who's there that's present. Others do it for every member of the family, even if they're not present. And there's also a slice that's cut for the house. And uh, for, since Greeks are very uh, spiritual and, <clears throat> excuse me, religious, uh, there's also pieces that are cut for, uh, you know, for Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary and so on and so forth. And whoever gets the piece with the coin is the person that will have luck for that year. So those are my three little anecdotal cake stories. What happens when the Virgin Mary gets the coin? When the Virgin Mary gets the coin or, or Jesus Christ or the house, it's basically like a general blessing or a general good luck for everyone. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. All right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marianne Berlue, and I'm from Richmond Hill. No, I'm from Oak Ridges. I lie about it a lot because it's not the most pleasant area of the uh, north of Toronto suburbs. <laughs> I just recently moved to Ottawa. Hence, I'm here. I'm actually recording the cake stories this year. And my cake story is inspired by the woman who was here earlier tonight who shared the story about her grandmother's cake. I grew up being close to my mom's family because my dad's family was mostly in the States and really refused to travel north ever to see us. So our exposure to them was very limited. So I grew up with my mom's side, which was English, and my grandmother baked so many desserts. Our family is famous for all of its family gatherings being made of half desserts. <laughs> I mean, we all get through the roast so that at the end we have our selection of 10 different desserts to choose from. Um, and every season has a different variety. Um, my grandmother passed away a couple years ago and ever since it's been this journey to try to find something similar to her pumpkin pie. She, I have her recipe. I've gotten pretty close, but it's just this such a light touch or a touch of someone who's done it so many times that they don't even think about it anymore that ends up in the pie that is irreplaceable. And uh, again, I <laughs> it seems ridiculous, but I'm definitely getting very emotional about this. Um, she meant a lot to me and a lot to our family. Um, there was also her famous um, butter tarts and my mom's family is very, um, 
very much based around my grandmother. So uh, my cousins are actually my mom's cousins' children. Uh, and so my, mom, my grandmother had a sister, and her and her sister were always competing about whose butter tarts are the best. And of course, my cousins always thought that their grandmother's butter tarts were the best. But I know that my grandmother, their Aunt Marianne, her butter tarts were the best because they weren't as runny and they had less raisins, which is very essential, um, as you may know. Also, uh, my grandma makes, oh, she made the best fruitcake. Like, you'll go into the grocery store and you'll get fruitcake and it's all dark fruitcake. Everyone hates dark, fru dark fruitcake, that's fine. Light fruitcake is where it's at. Light fruitcake is delicious, and I need to find her recipe and, and do it because it's beautiful. It's not overly liqueured. Oh, and there's um, another thing they ma she made was the plum pudding at Christmas, that uh, steamed pudding. You steam it in a bowl, and it's just basically made of candied fruit, and it's kind of gross and kind of delicious at the same time, and you make the hard sauce for it which is also very essential to the experience. Um, and my mother, after her mother passed away, my grandmother passed away, um, she made the, uh, the Christmas pudding. Um, I don't know what I called it before, but it's Christmas pudding. She made it and she's kind of like hoarding it. I think she made it close enough to her mother's recipe that she doesn't want to let it die, and you can technically preserve the Christmas pudding until the next year. It's kind of like a weird, I don't know, I think if you just make sure it doesn't get any bacteria in it, it will be fine for the next year. So that's on the back of my parents' fridge until Christmas this year, in a few months, <laughs> which is really bizarre. But this, all of these desserts are so essential to my family sticking together, and my grandmother was kind of that person who gathered us all together every year, and we had family celebrations at her place, and she would all kind of tell us to uh, be nice to each other if anyone was having any fights. And now that she's passed, ha getting together is harder, and even now I know that no one is looking forward to getting together anymore because her desserts are gone and none of us have figured out how to make them perfectly yet, and my sister and I try every year, and every year we're so disappointed in ourselves, and our family is kind of like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> well, we know that they're lying. So anyways, um, dessert is like the foundation of my family. <laughs> Hence why I like it so much, and uh, I don't think I'll ever let sugar die. <laughs> anyways, thanks so much.